three, four. Let us pray. Our prayer today is from Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10. <clears throat> Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Our first hymn, number 335, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, first and last verse 335. seated for the reading of the psalm. Our psalm is Psalm 82, verses 1 through 8. Uh, this psalm is actually quoted by Jesus. 
in the New Testament. We'll say this responsively. I will start with the first verse and continue with the odd, and you respond with the even. God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth. For all the nations are your inheritance. Our next hymn is number 138, Nothing But the Blood, first and last verse, 138. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. But the blood of Jesus. Verse 4. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now together we'll say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring your tithes and offerings into his courts. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this day and for this our opportunity to bring to you, Lord, our gifts of time and talent and treasure and the glory of the kingdom, the work of the church here on earth. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. seated for special music. Yep. Yeah. We 
praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, God of glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, God of glory, Again. We, we praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, find the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. The epistle reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 to 40, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and eroded foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they may gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 12, verses 49 to 56. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. 
but I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? The word and gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. In the words of my mouth, Heavenly Father, and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and, and pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Praise God. A great cloud of witnesses. And the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, this is one of the most famous passages uh, people recognize almost instantly. Uh, talking about the great cloud of witnesses that we in the body of Christ are surrounded by speaking directly of the heroes of the faith in uh, and in particular uh, Old Testament uh, in is what uh, what the author to Hebrews is talking about so let's think about this <clears throat> since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses isn't that that imagery interesting it's not like uh, a forest or a parking lot or uh, you know something like that or the uh, you know the Astrodome or whatever it's a cloud great cloud of witnesses there's so many that you can't see the individual particles but it's a just a vast panorama of the lives of people that have gone before us that went through so many trials and did so much and and so much happened to and they did they did and accomplished so much that uh we are blessed and strengthened uh and uh as as it says in hebrews 11 that you know some of them we don't even know their names but there are these individuals that we can point to like king david like um samuel that did so much like gideon you know these these folks did incredible stuff and were they like superman to begin with that you know you jump into a phone booth and poof, you know all of a sudden put the superman uniform on and, and and a cape and and all of a sudden you can do anything you can fly you can you know man of steel you know blah 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 etc no these were regular people uh and uh these were folks like us and i think that's the point here is that these folks in combination with their faith in the one true living god accomplished amazing things and so we are uh, some people think hebrews was written by paul some people think it was written by somebody else uh, but the author it talks about the life of faith and so we accomplish many things sometimes it's uh, we move the kingdom forward by inches and sometimes you've heard me talk about uh, for instance our number of visits on YouTube sometimes we increase by inches and sometimes by miles I think that's a pretty common experience amongst God's people uh, but speaking of the life of faith we move forward sometimes by inches we move forward some by times by miles uh, Hebrews says to us let us strip off every weight that slows us down and especially the sin that so easily trips us up so it's there's just so much in this the life of faith and he's already spoken the author of Hebrews uh, faith as being substance uh, and we 
preached on that last week faith is actually substance the substance of things hoped for now hope is a marvelous thing and we need it and it's absolutely wonderful but hope and faith are slightly different i was really thinking about that this week what's the difference between faith and hope because in some ways they're so similar it's a belief of of a kind faith depends on a lot on a lot on who we are basing our faith on or what we are basing our faith on now we are christians and we are basing our faith on the person of jesus christ and of the jesus christ of the bible the jesus christ who, who spoke the beatitudes the jesus christ who raised the dead the jesus christ who went to the cross for us our faith is predicated on him on his on his personality on the record that we have in the bible the the true reality that he is uh in our lives and so that's how our faith is more substantial than just sort of bland hope it's based on jesus that's why and so faith in jesus is substantial there are other things that we have faith on uh that may be not less uh substantial or reliable so hebrews says strip off every weight that slows us down and so uh, implicit in that is the idea that uh and i don't know if any of you have ever done this but i sure have we create obstacles i do we do create obstacles and impediments to our faith walk we we cause ourselves problems and i mean reality is that let's let's be honest that uh, we live in a fallen world and uh, part of the problem is me and us and um, so faith requires action it is an active word it's an active idea you know i can think the greatest thoughts sitting in my chair at home i can think beautiful thoughts powerful thoughts this kind of thought that kind of thought but until i get up out of my chair it doesn't do a hill of beans right uh if i'm just sitting in my chair and i don't get up and start acting on my faith then it's it's nothing so it requires action at some point i have to get up and go and act on my faith and so this is this is uh, just a, a memory came to me as i was pondering these things that the author of hebrews talks about the the life of faith the walk of faith getting up and doing things uh being effective and uncomplicated in our approach or being ineffective and complicated and and uh having a difficult time and so this is just a a, a recall that i had working with somebody in church so we had a a church member who was a, kind of a handy guy uh this is a, a different time different state somewhere else and um so there were windows that needed to be replaced and so this is a time when uh we didn't have home depot in littleton and lowe's in littleton and uh to, to do a home depot thing which generally was a, a pretty good deal uh you had to go all the way to tilton and so anyways so this carpenter i'll name bob um he said oh you save so much money don't get it from the local providers you know order from home depot and you know boom you know this is before home depot even delivered all that stuff and yeah we'll save tons of money doing it this way perfectly good window and so okay you know fine so this is the way it happened uh so the windows were ordered he drives down to tilton brings them back tries to put them in they're the wrong dimensions home depot he says home depot always does this and i said why didn't you measure them down there well i was busy and i didn't think of it okay uh so another trip down to tilton takes them back and reorders them so a couple weeks later they come in they're the right dimensions he brings them back then one of them is broken when he opens them up so another trip down to tilton and boom and so i said stop i said one more trip to tilton take these back get a refund 
and order it from these guys in town. And, and the difference in price was like 10 bucks. So the point of this story, as frustrated as I was, hey, sometimes I act like that. That's, that's one thing. Uh, and that, that this whole situation was unnecessarily complicated by some choices that were made along the way. And Lord knows I have done that. So Bob, uh, God bless him, it's not his name anyways, uh, uh, just was a great example of how a really basically simple process can be made very complicated and frustrating and difficult and it was uh, completely preventable by just spend, spending $10 more at the local provider. Uh, we make, I make our walk, our faith walk with God much more complicated and difficult than it needs to be. And so the place where we need to focus to help it to be uncomplicated is what is it that we have faith in? But if we can answer that question simply and clearly, then that's a great start. What, are, what is it that we have faith in? It's in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ of the Bible, Jesus Christ who is my Savior and my Lord, Jesus Christ who is, uh, I, I want to be good, I hope to be good, but true Jesus is truly good and all of that and more than I can even possibly imagine. And so my hope and my faith is in Him and that is a very, while it may be simple, it's powerfully, powerfully true. So some example, uh, anyway, so if I miss that mark, that's that if I deviate from that power of Jesus, my savior, I cause myself trouble for sure. So do we, do I construct obstacles in our faith walk? Uh, and of course we do, and it's a skill to learn how not to do that. So one of the things that we do is we come to church and we have fellowship and we pray for each other and we, we learn and we grow together. And that's a great, great, wonderful thing. Uh, so let's look at the heroes of the faith. We have David, uh, king, who became King David. Uh, he, we are introduced to him first as a shepherd boy. Uh, he was the youngest of seven, so he got all the lousy jobs. I was the youngest of four. I know what that's about. Uh, and uh, actually, my brothers had it the same as me, but I just complained more. That was what it was. Uh, David, shepherd boy, low, he got the, the lousy, lowest position in the family, got all the lousy jobs. Uh, but it, he actually kind of thrived there. That's the amazing thing in this, as the youngest of seven in this lousy job that he got of being the shepherd and taking the sheep <clears throat> and the, the uh, farm animals out to where the grass was, out to where the pasture was, and protecting them and watching out for them. That he, he learned a lot about God and about himself. And so, you know, he comes in from the fields, he's like 15. And uh, his dad says, uh, take food to your brothers there down at the, the battlefield. Uh, and uh, so take them this good food and come right back. And so David goes down, visits with the, uh, with the Israel army. King Saul is there all. The, and so the, uh, the uh, Goliath and his clan are over here. And uh, Saul and the Israelites are over here and they're sort of sneering at each other and sticking out their tongues and uh, uh, doing all kinds of taunting each other, that kind of thing, which is what was common before battle. They would sort of camp at opposite ends of a big field knowing that a battle would come and then they'd, they'd say nasty things to each other. Problem is, the bad guys, they've got Goliath and he's big. He's huge, in fact. And whether he's six foot four or eight foot nine, I don't know. He was huge. It, it is said in the Bible that he was one of a, a race of giants uh, who actually could be nine feet tall. That's what the Bible says. It also says that Goliath could throw the equivalent of a 12 foot six by six pressure treated. You know how heavy those are. A hundred yards with pinpoint accuracy. 100 yards. Uh, that's how big he was, and he was very skilled as a warrior, and he was ugly, and he smelled bad. I'm sure of it. Anyways, so David sees this Goliath guy, and it's like, why aren't we out there fighting him? And, and the implication was, of course, why isn't Saul, who was, stood uh, uh, head and shoulders above every other Israelite, why isn't Saul out there with all of his armor and everything making war on this guy? 
And so David says to his brothers, I can do this. I mean, yeah, we serve the one true living God. This is a piece of cake. And they're like, yeah, go back to your sheep. You know, you shoot, go home. Okay. And so finally he goes to Saul's tent and says, hey, I'll do it. You know, because all the Israelites were in great fear of Goliath. Goliath was, was huge, and he was strong, and he was skilled, and he could throw a, a big, heavy spear a long distance, and he smelled bad, and everybody was afraid of him. So David is there at Saul's tent. I'll do it. And Saul says, yeah, right. So he says, Dave says, give me a chance. Saul says, well, at least somebody is going to do this. Now, some of this is my paraphrase, you have to understand. So Saul gives him his armor, and Saul himself is, is large, is very big guy, he's muscular, strong. And so all of this armor just weighs David down completely, and he says, no, no I can't fight like this, take it away, I don't want it. Uh, and so he goes out, and he goes to a, a stream bed and picks out five smooth stones, <laughs> He's got a slingshot and his regular shepherd boy clothes, and he is a boy. And he starts, so Goliath is out there uh, in the middle of the field. You know, the scene is, of course, the bad guys are over here at one edge of the field. Goliath is right near the center, taunting Israel and King Saul. And the Israelites are over here shaking their boots. And so David comes out and reveals him to be the champion for Israel. Goliath is the champion for the bad guys. And, and so David starts walking very calmly. And Goliath sees him and says, like, am I a dog that you come after me with a stick? What is this? And uh, he starts cursing David by his own gods, it says in the Bible. So then David starts running at Goliath. And so Goliath says, okay, match set, here we go. And he starts running at. So there's probably 100 yards there that they have to, that they have to close. And Goliath throws his big, huge, heavy spear. And David dodges it very easily because he's extremely nimble. And then he takes that slingshot and he starts winging it like this and lets it go and that stone goes and plants itself right in Goliath's forehead and drops him like a stone boom on the ground so the next thing i think we we kind of don't get this so at that point david didn't try making friends with goliath okay he didn't invite him over for tea he didn't say, let's go have uh, lunch somewhere. He said, tell me your family history and maybe we can work this out. He cut off his head. That's really what happened. And Goliath was vanquished. Then the Israelites were saying, wow, here we go. So they went and they, they won the battle big time. David, the champion of Israel. But it, what is so interesting as a champion for Israel was that when David was, up, was replying to Goliath's challenge, he said, you come at me. You can almost see, this, he's a teenager, okay? How would a teenager say this? You come at we, me with the sword and spear. I come at you with the power of the living God. Whack! And so... Uh, you know, you can, you can imagine David as, as, you know, that sort of teenage, you know, waggle of the head and, and that, that amazing confidence uh, bordering on insanity that teenagers have sometimes. But look what God did through that. And, and uh, David became the, the great king of the, the great nation Israel. And that was one huge station on the way point to him becoming that king. So quickly, some, some more examples. Gideon, uh, way back in the time of Judges. So this is way back after, recently after the, the time of the escape from Egypt. Gideon, hiding in a wine vat. Oh, I'm threshing grain here. Yes, it was grain from two years ago, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm in the wine vat. So he was hiding. And the angel comes to him and says, the Midianites are beating up on your people here and doing terrible things and causing famine. And, and Gideon's very happily hiding in a wine 
behind that. And the angel says to him, Hail, O mighty man of God, uh, when he's hiding in a wine vat. But you know what? With God's help, with Gideon, he went out and he led uh, the, the Israelites and they beat up the, the Midianites and got them out of their territory and things were great. Samuel, another great hero, Old Testament hero of the faith. When he was a boy, he did uh, just amazing things. He worked in the tabernacle. They didn't have the temple yet. And he worked for the, the priest Eli. And God used him at age like five or six to say something to Eli, who had some sons that were very, very bad boys. Very, very, very bad boys. Uh, and God used Samuel to speak to Eli and said, hey, I've told you and I've told you, get these guys under control. They're exploiting the people of Israel. They're doing very bad things now. So this is a five, six-year-old boy saying to the head priest, speaking the voice of God, uh, you know, you've got a problem here, pal, and there's no, there's no easy fix for it. And so Samuel grew in the grace of God and then over his lifetime uh, did many, many wonderful, powerful things, including he became essentially a kingmaker for the nation Israel. He, so heroes of the faith, heroes of the faith, believed in God Almighty. What they did in some way or another involved speaking the truth, speaking and doing the truth of God, and that in each in each case, uh, all these three guys, they spoke about God, they served God with respect and reverence, and their efforts resulted in major, major wins, major victories for the faith that, uh, that we share with them. So back to Hebrews, let us run the race with endurance. There is implicit in that the idea that uh, it requires endurance. We're in it for the long haul here. Uh, and. Uh, Okay, so a lot of us, all of us, have been in it for the long haul, and the, the promise that we have is that there is struggle, and that there is challenges, there are challenges along the way, and it is work and everything, but we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, the heroes of the faith who have been there, done that, and experienced it, suffered, were blessed, had uh, problems, had challenges, had victories, uh, but that they were consistent in their faith in God. And that, so how do we accomplish this? The author of Hebrews says, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is our champion. Just like David was the champion of Israel, and he built, beat Goliath, and uh, so also Gideon, and in a sense, so also Samuel. Jesus is our champion who initiates, is the author. <clears throat> he also initiates and perfects, or is the author and finisher of our faith. And so uh, our faith is a, is a work in progress. And God initiated it, and he helps us to finish it and perfect it. And he is so good about that, and so it is a great prayer. And uh, why don't we say a prayer right now for all of us that we ask for God's help to, to, to perfect our faith, to work our faith. And, uh, and so, anyways, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we invite you, we eagerly desire that uh, you come and continue to help us and help us to, you are the initiator, the author of our faith, Lord, but we also, we need your help in the perfecting of our faith. And so, Lord, we, we offer our own efforts and desires and, uh, and all of that to you to use, Lord, but we also ask for more. Uh, uh, we need your help, Lord. And so come help us in the perfecting of our faith. And because we keep our eyes on you, we want to keep our eyes on you. And uh, Lord, it is through the victory that you won us in the cross that we can even contemplate this. And we thank you for that. And we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And this brings us to this point, <laughs> Hebrews 12, 14, the goal work at living in peace with everyone and that we are to look after each other amen first and fourth like a river going is my perfect peace over all victorious in his bride Yeah. 
verse 3. Every joy or trial falleth from above. Trace upon our dial by the Son of Love. We may trust Him for May the Lord bless you and keep you to make his face to shine upon you and bring you his peace. Amen. Amen.